which are for R&D. They have been a manufacturing facility for a long time. But research and development, they have been getting into over the last three or four years or so. And uh, he's the brains behind uh, uh, putting that infrastructure uh, on the board where they are researching for. So PhD is once you graduate, maybe there are some opportunities there for you to keep it there. Uh, Dr. Rafik uh, got his PhD from MIT in geophysics and he's been working with that uh, worldwide with many, many of those uh, countries, uh, including many in Africa. Uh, so he's very uh, well experienced in this area. And uh, today he's going to talk, uh, talk to us about uh, successful deployment of new EVO technologies in the field, connecting new technologies and its field deployment. What are the innovations, what are the challenges, etc. So please join me in welcoming. Thank you and uh, good afternoon. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about how can I successfully end. This is based mainly, mostly on lessons learned from some pilots that we already performed in EOR that could have been done better. So it's again, an interactive technique. Uh, I'd like to mention I upgraded the version of uh, this, uh, this presentation, an upgrade of a presentation I've done to the SPE not so long ago in Abu Dhabi. And the title of the workshop was Journey to 70% Recovery Factor. And this is a target that had not aspired to reach 70% recovery factor. Uh, Currently, we're in about 35, 40% of recovery, so this gives a lot of room for improvement. It may take some time to get to 70%. Nevertheless, it's good to have that kind of vision. And you'll see here that kind of vision, I hope, why EOR is important uh, for Adma. So the outline, I think, it would be nice to spend a few minutes on explaining who is ADNOC, for those of you who don't know. Refine the definition of what technology effectiveness and efficiency in deploying technology is. I think it's just simple terminology, but something we use. And again, ADNOC EOR, what's our strategy? It has a bright future, but again, we need to learn from the our lesson, I mean, the past the trials and lessons to, to increase and how can we successfully deploy new art technologies and this is the last slide that gives you gains basic type of information on how to try to minimize uh, the risk of uh, deploying new art technologies. So for those who don't know where uh, Adnok is located, it's in Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates. There are seven Emirates. The biggest ones are Abu Dhabi and Dubai, and there are five others. Uh, I think that the point here to see is that the UAE is somewhat splitting the east from the west, and so they, they use that as an advantage. Is again, one way is to make sure that a lot of the technologies, research coming from the West or the East are also being used in Abu Dhabi. But conversely, they're a good way to communicate too. And you can see that beyond the oil and gas industry, uh, Dubai Airport, Qatar in some areas, in the GCC or Abu Dhabi, they use, you can have, you can fly high through non-stop from Dubai to Houston. And so they make it much easier to again communicate from the east to the west. So it has a strategic point and they're trying again to benefit from that. So Adnoc is a fully integrated oil and gas company. So it goes again from the what we call the oil uh, exploration and production, gas, business refining, distribution, petrochemicals, but also logistic and marine business. So you'll see that across the presentation, the way it's organized, it does cover all the, I would say, the disciplines of the integrated oil and gas company. It 
has research in EMP, but also in refining. It's called Takri Research Center. And in petrochemical, there's another research center called Beau Rouge Innovation Center. And it's through a joint venture with Borealis uh, in Europe. So that's how the petrochemical has that kind of R&D activity. We've been the past three years trying to talk, to discuss seek synergies. We're not there yet, but we already initiated some discussion and we see the need, some, some aspects of it to, to, to integrate. Pillars of Adnan. It's a national company, so it has a duty to provide again some uh, social uh, component in, in their mission. So, as you see in, in the, the people that formed the uh, ADNOC group, we have the Petroleum Institute, which uh, some of you know and you have visited. They have a technical institute, it's more training, Glenelg School, Abu Dhabi ADNOC Scholarship Program is very important. It sends students local, mostly here, in Iraqis abroad to get their bachelor's, master's, and PhDs, and also favors a lot of on-the-job training. One of the strengths of Adnoc it has what we call shareholders uh, and customers, and some of them are the major oil companies, as you can see here, ExxonMobil, Borealis, we spoke about Jotco, Japan, Oxy, Shell, DP, Total, Partex, and Japanese, uh, Jotco is also there with Mitsui. And you see here their uh, corporate uh, social responsibility, which is to ensure that uh, the population uh, and UAE citizens uh, have that kind of ease to use energy in a safe and in a healthy environmental context. The organization is again, you can see it's a traditional one. You have equation production director, gas processing director, marketing, refining, uh, petrochemical, and shared services. And here you see from the ad hoc R&D uh, where I work mostly is on the upstream, midstream side because gas processing has some midstream. The Takri Research Center, I was saying, is on the refining. And the petrochemical, we have the Global Innovation Center. All this right now is being uh, reorganized with our new CEO. We had a new CEO appointed in, in February of this year. And he's seeking more synergies, more efficiencies across, uh, if you want, the organization, not only in Adnoc headquarters, but also in what we call the operating companies. You may have heard of ADCO, ZADCO, ADMA. Uh, ADCO is onshore, ZADCO is offshore, but for ZACUM, Upper ZACUM, which is the major reservoir <coughs> of the biggest fields in the world in terms of reserves, ADMA is marine, other marine than ZADCO. Uh, and you have NDC, which is a drilling company that provides services to most of the assets that's part of the exploration. But you have also the gas processing, gas to add gas, add custom gas, elixir. So I think all this is now being seen through a new lens. How can you more effective, bring more value to the shareholder? And six months from now, maybe if someone showed you the organization of Adnan, it may be different than this one. So we're currently undergoing this transformation. The other thing to see a bit, and uh, I'll get back to the numbers, yes, thank you. Uh, reserves of Abu Dhabi uh, in oil, it gives you an idea. It has 7% 7, 7 of the world reserves, number 6. It has 100 billion barrels of reserve, more or less, it's 98, 97. So it's enormous. I think uh, you see Exxon has about 30, 40. They have three times Exxon reserves. And 
and other companies, Total, for example, has 10 or 12. So it's eight times bigger than, uh, than the reserves. So it's tremendously big. It's number seven in, in, in gas reserves. Many of the gas here is sour gas. So that's another problem. How do you treat, process sour gas? So that's a research area also to try to do that. There are existing technologies, but I think now they're innovative ones that we need to to fill a local test. So out of the 100 billion barrel of reserves, uh, we were talking about recovery factor, and that we're using 25% of recovery factor. Now, each percent that you're able to get, I would say, is more than a billion barrels. So each percent of recovery factor is three giant fields in the Gulf of Mexico. Each percent. So it can show you the potential of UR or the importance of UR in that kind of the region that the minute recovery factor that you can apply to the fields will bring tremendous value. It has about 40,000 employees and the target is to have 75% emiratization, which means the ratio of uh, local uh, employees versus uh, the total number, we should have 75% by 2017. Right now, on the average, is somewhere around 40, 50. So it's still good. And most of the 40, 50 are, again, they need to be more on the technical side, they're not. So there is a challenge to get to 75%. But you see, again, the corporate social uh, responsibility you have, you have to contribute to the education and social stability of the nation. Adnok operates in a unique environment. We have operating companies with partners. IOC, NOC, with the Petroleum Institute, second needs, and second need, as Kumar mentioned, from the foul. There are second needs from Shell, from Exxon. And whenever we are in Adnok, we wear the hat of Adnok. We are not, I'm not a total guy in Adnan. I have to talk with Shell, Exxon, the same way I would talk to Total. So that's not easy. Because if you behave like that, the guy from Total, the management is very supportive and they understand that, but you can understand some of your peers. They say, come on, you try to arrange something. No, I'm sorry, you have to fit with the same process as others. So that's very important to, to know that the second lease role is something that's original, and it's somewhat unique in that kind of environment. But it gives also I know, that extra strength because they put in their team very skilled people that come across from Exxon, from Shell, BP, Total to work in specific uh, technical areas. I mentioned about that, managers are really hydrocarbon assets, that's Admox's mission. And that they are aspiring 7% of the recovery. They want to optimize the production to meet growing needs. So 3.5 million barrels of oil capacity. Right now they're about at three. So there is some room. And they would like again to increase oil and gas reserves through uh, what we call new new assets like type of or unconventional resources. That's also something that is being pursued. Regarding R&D, initiatives were launched in 2007 in R&D, but there was no dedicated organization. It was more uh, committees that were uh, meeting and uh, funding that was given directly to the Petroleum Institute and the Petroleum Institute used to do some research by funding a lot of external universities to do the research. So since 2013, there's been R&D organization in, in ADNO, this is new, and there were also R&D organizations in some of the OCOs. And so the whole goal now is to have a comprehensive framework for R&D in ADNO, the governance, the processes, an organization that is optimal in the current uh, context. So here's a little refresher. 
about technology. What is new technology? So, we are using what we call the technology readiness level that NASA developed back in the 70s. It's a very useful tool. There are different technology readiness levels, not only the one from NASA. We picked the one from NASA that has nine levels. There are others that have seven. But no matter <coughs> what, it's like a language, whether you speak English or Chinese or Indian, you communicate. So as long as you have a language, and Adnan did not have a language, so we just took this one. And the reason we like it is because it's balanced between research, technology development, and technology deployment. So essentially, one, two, three is more the fundamental science. Progressively gets into three means you prove your concept, research. <coughs> when you go to four, it starts entering what we call the technology development. You're developing it. You're starting to have an engineer perspective. Here, the focus is more science. Here's an engineer that starts taking over. And seven is the first pilot in operations in the asset. It's not the pilot in the lab. And nine is off-the-shelf technology. So if you see that, every DNA of a technology has a TRL. When you start with your idea, you're in one. You prove the concept, you have three. You have to go to four. So what we did in Andoc, if you put two stages, <coughs> some companies that have been running R&D for decades have several stage gates. We started with two. One is a stage gate, like an exam. Before going to development, you pass from research to development. That's stage gate, it's a criteria. And another exam, before you pilot how to prepare a pilot. So right now, and I'm not we're testing this new process for the technology qualification, but it's important to see that we're talking a common language between operations when we talk about research and development. The perception from researchers is once they finish their proof of concept, oh, I'm ready to pilot. There's all this integration, understanding what operations is, engineering, de-risking, understanding the risk that is important. And this is also something important for academia to understand. Conversely, when you ask operations about new technologies, they think that everything is low-hanging fruit. Oh, great, we'll solve my problem tomorrow. So if you tell them it's going to take four or five years, they may say, I'm, by four or five years, I'm not here anymore. So. That's where that part is the part that is critical for an oil and gas company to have its own resources. To work with academia on one to three. If it can have its own researchers for one to three, why not? And we're starting already from a not standpoint to say the four, five, six is really something we need to build because we need to work directly with the assets. However, on the one, two, three, we have to rely on universities, on cooperation with UAE universities and international. So again, new technology is a technology that is ready to be qualified, ready to be deployed, and it's more in the six to seven. Okay, now that you see the whole picture of technology, what we talk about new technology is something here. The other thing that we've been working a lot is we need to be effective and efficient. So we use these words in, in a different order, and here the attempt is to try to put the sense. The word effectiveness is dependent on the organization you are at. It means it aligns with the strategic priorities and the time of delivery of your organization. Efficiency is you maximize synergies, your processes to run more efficiently, faster, a lower cost. Okay, the two are complementary, and that's what here I'm trying to show. Ideally, what you would like to be efficient and effective. However, you can be efficient, but ineffective, which means that you're not necessarily aligned, so you will die quickly. Hey, you're not in line with our strategy. That's it, forget it. You can be effective but not efficient. So you have processes that take a long time, like procurement.
improvement, maintain six months a year, you survive, but you're not at all efficient. And of course, if you're ineffective and inefficient, then you die slowly. Um, so, but I hope you, you, you see that kind of thing. We'll see that again. Ideally, again, we're trying to strive to get to this point. Uh, from our standpoint, we're going more from surviving to more uh, being more uh, efficient. Because we, are, we have a process that we need to be more efficient. We're in line with the strategy. So we are already effective. But again, it's, uh, we have some room to go from here to here. So you will see that in the examples. So <coughs> let's get to some technical components. CO2, UR, and Abu Dhabi. So this is the overall objective. Uh, is to identify and implement the EOR portfolio to sustain Abu Dhabi long-term production capacity and that goes a bit in line with what I was saying regarding the reserves and the impact of EOR every percent counts tremendously some of the drivers commitment towards reduction of UAE carbon footprint export alternative production mechanism for enhancing recovery chemical EOR is one that we're again pushing for we have availability of CO2 developing the difficult uh, oil, uh, adding more residual oil, I mean, extracting more, adding reserves. And mostly what Adam has been doing is re-injecting hydrocarbon gas. And that, you may ask yourself, if you re-inject another gas that's not hydrocarbon, you can make value of the hydrocarbon gas. So that's, and they need uh, more hydrocarbon gas. Uh, for power generation. So that also is another way maybe to, to use uh, UR or other gases so that it frees up the hydrocarbon gas for commercial purposes. The UR pilots, the first pilot was started in 2009 and the pilot objectives were to assess injectivity, asphaltine deposition, that's the type of uh, floor assurance that we had in, uh, in Abu Dhabi. Uh, we don't have high rates, but asphaltine is, uh, is an issue. Uh, it's being mitigated, we've done some research and development on it, but again, in this case of CO2, we want to make sure we're not uh, facilitating asphaltine deposition. To study the impact on facilities, uh, uh, corrosion type of issues, collect field data, assess incremental oil. All these were the key performance parameters on the 2009 pilot. And it was uh, an injector and a producer and observer well. And to try to see a bit how uh, we can do that uh, from the injector to the, the producer. So that was run with some limited success. Nevertheless, we got some lesson learned from it. Very encouraging that again the CO2 uh, did, uh, if one, uh, was able to recover more oil on the production and particularly on the uh, observer well, we were able to see uh, that kind of uh, increase the recovery. The, the market or the potential, as you can see here, there's a lot of EOR pilots that are, are to be executed by 2020. 10 plus, it's an enormous amount of pilots. They're not all CO2, I should say, it's CO2 plus other EOR uh, pilots. And the two key uh, fields, first and other reservoir, is that field for tight reservoirs and Rumaita is this transition zone type of uh, setup. So these are potentially the bad field, particularly the San Kananadi, which is the reservoir level, that is one of the most, uh, that contains the most oil in Kandari. And they conducted the pilot again, it started the end 2009, 2010, 11, they were able to monitor it, or the observer well. The point 
here, lessons learned, they were able to again successfully fast track from concept to execution in, in less than 18 months. That's a record to, to, to be able to do that. And again, that was the key championed by Adnot Adco Senior Management. We had technology partners from Virginia and Baker Hughes. So we could see on the observer well that uh, the CO2 and the OR, uh, for the OR, and this is a YBE, provided that kind of uh, recovery. Again, at the pilot scale, so there were still some other issues that were unresolved. It took several years, and now we're ready, based on that kind of lesson learned, to start the point currently with the CO2 injection in the Brumaica, again, this is the field uh, with the, another CO2 injection with some kind of volume of 6 million stuff uh, in data. It's still a pilot. Again, once you go to full field, we may revisit the volume of CO2. Do we have enough CO2 for full field? That's a big question. Uh, but we may blend the CO2 with other gases or try to find different ways of uh, uh, blending CO2, let's say carbonate water or things like that. Uh, the second example where we learned from that kind of uh, uh, EOR experiment is 4D seismic monitoring. It was conducted uh, in 2006-2007 based on two uh, 3D data set that's of both 4D, so they compared the 99 seismic to 2005. They made some kind of difference and see where are the fluid movements. That also showed here after a lot of processing, and there wasn't really a qualification back then of technology, so uh, it's not easy to, to track down what were the key performance parameters of the pilot. But after a lot of massaging of the data, we're able, here's the injector, to monitor where are the 4D gas. So here, this is essentially like a difference between 2005 minus 1999. So what you see here is how the gas is injected. And you see some, again, uh, response here, a lesser response as you go. But what was nice to see that there was some kind of zone that was bypassed by the injection. So that also was confirmed by some, some wells. Uh, so the benefit of 4D, you can see it potentially, but the effort in producing this map uh, was tremendous. And again, when you look back at 2006, the technology that they had for 4D in carbonates was not uh, as little. As a consequence, currently, we are with the help of technology partners, mainly Total and CGG, have done feasibility studies to show again how the 4D, if we have to now uh, to redeploy it, be done, what are the key performance parameters. And one of the things that came up from that study is you need permanent sources and sensors, or at least permanent sensors, because when you come to do repeated surveys, every time you have to redeploy the receivers, then you just increase the, the possibility of having more noise in the data. And it will allow you to have more frequent monitoring than waiting six years between each shot. So currently they're evaluating that kind of feasibility <coughs> results. And the intention is to monitor some of these uh, CO2 or EOR type of pilots. If you cannot monitor there is little value in UR because you won't know what are you sweeping. So you need some monitoring technique, either with observer wells or some geophysical technique, to be able to know where the fluids are going. So that's key. So it goes hand by hand with the UR pilot to have some kind of monitoring technique. And that's why this in itself is a pilot to the UR pilot. So it's a second level. The other thing I mentioned is again the technology qualification process. It's a lesson learned. We need to have a common language for when we talk about technology. And we're trying to implement that. We learned in the past 
from the way R&D was used. R&D for people could be here, could be here, could be here, could be given eight. If not off the shelf, it's R&D. So once you start having common language, it makes it easier for people to talk when you introduce a technology, what level it is, more or less. And so I think this is key. One way in Adnan of trying to make a difference is to put special effort in 456. And here is what you see. Essentially what we're trying to say is any technology, as you run across the maturity, cannot just stop here and hand on the report, and then four, five, the team 456 will come and hand on the report. You need a continuous working, interacting between research, universities, the ad hoc r and team, and operations. And you can see that there needs that kind of continuous handshake. If you don't have this handshake, a lot of the technologies or research that you do will fall in what we call the valley of death. Good ideas, not enough engineering, pull, it just dies. So you have a lot of good ideas that will never evolve or be piloted. So we're hoping with that kind of R&D team that will have that kind of skill, knowing what research universities do, but also knowing what the industry has, this is not easy to, to have, but this is what we're trying to, to gather in in Adnan, will mitigate, minimize the risk of good ideas uh, falling into the valley of death. This is my last slide. That summarizes a bit in three bullet points. How can we be more effective and efficient? on uh, deploying UR technologies to the field. One, that is key, and I think it's valid even beyond Adnan. Make sure you have someone as close as you can to the asset who is championing that technology, that is willing to take the risk. If you have someone in the asset who doesn't like the risk, if you choose that kind of asset, you need someone who can say, okay, it's a small error, but I have the support of R&D to help me succeed. So this is very important. Is you must be at the senior management level. If you don't have it, check, do it with another asset. Okay? But even the first pilot, you don't want to risk uh, having, again, that kind of bad pilot result. Now, a pilot, by definition, if you have the correct key performance parameters, you may check yes, yes, no, it doesn't need to be a failure or all success. You have to learn from it. So that kind of notion of from the beginning to say the pilot has all these criteria and through the pilot we'll be able to check this work, this does not work, but we'll find out why, etc. is key. The second thing is to have our own technology qualification process, which is what I was telling you, the stage dates. We need to have our own internal because that will allow to evaluate the risk and particularly show to the management what are the risks and that we're willing to take that risk to pilot. So it's very important to have that. We did not have that in the past and therefore it was difficult to say when a pilot was successful or not, what are the lessons learned. And last but not least, we cannot do everything alone. <laughs> We have to select the right partners with complementing competencies to work on that kind of piloting of new technologies that are aligned in sharing risks, rewards, and intellectual property considerations because that also is important. So these are the three things that we came up saying if we're able to satisfy in some way, it just minimizes the risk of having more difficulties and here in your pilot. Uh, and again, it's based on uh, several years being in ad hoc, talking with some of our colleagues. <coughs> and so we're, we're currently now implementing this in our future pilots, particularly the technology qualifications being tested <coughs> all across the ad hoc group. And hopefully, we'll start seeing benefits uh, from it. So uh, with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Questions? Before the question, I open the floor for questions. I just want to share some of my 
experience uh, with uh, you all a long, long time ago. After I finished my PhD in chemical engineering and did my postdoc, the first job I had was with uh, Gulf Canada Resources. And the first job that was given to me was enhanced oil recovery. I didn't know anything about petroleum engineering <laughs> or enhanced oil recovery. And within six months, I had to write a simulator for something called slim tube displacement that they used to understand whether visibility occurs between the oil in place and the fluid that you inject CO2 would be one of those. And so I had to put together flow through porous media, thermodynamics, and all that. It was a wonderful learning experience. The reason I'm pointing this out is some of you are pure chemical engineers, even if you're wondering what you are, is how does it like to me? But of course, controlling engineers here know that very well. So, what you're learning at a PhD level is how to address a challenging problem. The problem can be coming from anywhere, depending on where you get the job. Okay, so the other thing that I want to share with is this technology readiness level. I've been in academia all my life, I didn't know anything about this until a few years ago when I started putting the proposals together. So, um, for example, the one to three that you talked about, universities are well funded in carrying out that phase of research. The way that research has evolved in uh, advanced countries, including the US. And then industry takes care of the last part, seven, eight, and nine, uh, in terms of piloting and developing technologies that they can deploy. But all the funding agencies have been struggling with this. I think the concept was put together by Yes. And every every federal government agency, DOD, Department of Defense, Department of Energy, they all have a version of this idea. But there is this concept of a valley of death between four, five, and six. How do you take basic ideas and develop a technology that can be deployed? And nobody is paying attention uh, to that. So the funding agencies are trying to fill fill that gap. What I see the advantage that Adnock and other companies that are setting up the infrastructure is that you can address the problem directly by putting the pipeline completely through. Here there is a disconnect between universities and industries. They come together, which is what EPIC is about, trying to bring industry and university together in some way. Then we can address that problem in some way. But I think that not probably has a more elegant solution. If you succeed in taking it all the way and if you are the architect of that, I hope uh, that's very successful. Uh, with that comment, let me open up. I have a question. You mentioned the recovery of like 35 40%. Is that after water flooding or just yes. the natural drive? No, water flow. And the mm -hmm. test that you are doing with CO, at what stage the well or the field was? Like it was after water flooding or you? It was after water flooding. Uh, and we prepared it too well, but it was a pilot. I wasn't there, so it's difficult back then to get even the lessons learned. It was six years, but it shows you that if you don't have a process, but yes, it was treated. Uh, they uh, prepared the wells for CO2, so the, the wells were with special steel uh, for that kind of experiment. Uh, and the, the, this encouraged that kind of further research. So I think the results, although they, I didn't say anything quantitative, triggered all these uh, interests, and now CO2, UR, is the thing that. Uh, had not is really aiming at. So do you think that the seventy percent recovery will be achievable only by CO2 or there is no. a mixture of the techniques? It's a mixture. And there are some fields even in Abu Dhabi that are sixty percent huh? small, unfortunately. Uh, well, fortunately because it means you can have more resources elsewhere. <coughs> uh, so yes, I think uh, it's reachable. And I don't, I think other, uh, I think Norway also had at some point uh, that kind of target of 70%. So I don't think it's unrealistic. It's not tomorrow, but it is uh, possible. And it makes sense even environmentally. Why would you need a field that has more than two thirds of its oil in place? Does it make sense? It's not efficient. Are they all carbonates? Most of them. What's not carbonates is more. Uh, the deep gas, pre or things like that, are not necessarily carbons, but the majority of existing fields are carbons, yes. Jurassic type of carbons. I uh, a really interesting, great talk, by the way, and I like, like corporate perspective. Yeah. I've been in uh, 
corporate R&D for four years of my life, and so I can relate to a lot of the things you're talking about. But uh, on that note, like how many uh, different like programs do you have in parallel for EOR? So you talked about what mainly one today, which was uh, you know, CO2 enhanced uh, EOR. And you know, when I was in the drug world, we'd have like you know eight or something in parallel. We only know one or two will make it to the end. No. Everything else would be a loser and a cost to the company. But that one that made it made us a billion dollars, you know, or something like that. So we, I mean, what we're trying to do, we have 10 programs. One of them is UR. The other one is reservoir characterization and modeling. The other one is geophysics, <coughs> flow assurance, you see. And in each program, we have projects, mm -hmm. which is what you're relating. How many projects are there in UR? We have about a dozen for you are. Okay. The challenge we have now in this new framework is when you map it here, a lot of the dozen is somewhere here. Mm -hmm. Fine, is that the best distribution? We need a balanced portfolio. So ideally, we need to try to gather a balanced portfolio where we have low hanging fruits that we can pilot or test or make feasibility, but also ensure that we have some projects all across the maturity. Scale. And we don't have that right now. So to answer your question, yes, we have about a dozen. Not all are ready to pilot, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And each of them would have sort of like a different timeline, right? Different so, timeline. You know, if you're down there, you might think, well, it might be 20 some years before we could get to nine. Hopefully not. But. So <laughs> the, the life of each technology to go from one to nine is different. Sometimes people used to ask me in operations, okay, once you show this, how long does it take to go from one to nine? It depends on the technology, it depends on the sector and IT. We can go from one to nine in two years. You can see evolution to cell phone. In uh, oil and gas industry, the average is 20 to 30 years. Now I cannot say 20 to 30 years, you're going to say, oh gosh, but the average was that. But it's shrinking. Mm -hmm. And if you want more uh, visual things, more IT related, it's faster. But Drilling technologies take 10 to 15 years. The 3D seismic took 25 years. So the industry is very uh, conservative, very resistant. Because once you start being in operations, particularly drilling, look what happened in Macondo. You cannot take a lot of risks. You want to make sure you have to insist. So the guys who are championing 1, 2, 3 to go to 4, 4, 5, 6, they have white hair by the time they get to 7. Because they have to fight a resistive if you want organizations saying, no, it won't work. No, it's, I'm not satisfied. So it requires a lot of stamina, determination, and patience to, to bring across technology. So the message for you guys, don't despair because there is one no. If you believe in it, insist, come with, uh, understand better what they do in mind, so that when you communicate the message, you don't oversell, but you show that you understand how they're currently operating and what added value you can bring. You said 18 months, uh, so from where to where did you go in those 18 months on this chart? Uh, when did I say 18 months? Uh, one of the, yes, I think it was CO2 piloting, was it? I think uh, CO2 piloting. Okay, well, the CO2 piloting was done before I arrived, so there was no theoretical scale. So, the impression I can tell you right now, the CO2 pilot went from 3 to 7. There was no real comprehensive, when I say what are the feasibility reports or try to find me that, it's not easy. It's somewhere. The contractor may have had it, but they didn't have an internal system for technology qualification and therefore we cannot go back and learn from the pilot. It's all word of mouth. Oh, here's a presentation, one slide, like the one I showed you, but it doesn't say a lot. But having said that, it was a successful experiment. It's what triggered uh, that kind of interest to, to pursue CO2. You are. Five or six seem to be, you know, very similar, same thing, but uh, what's the progression from five to six? They're almost identical. Uh, you have more in the, in the six. You're starting to see the fully integrated. It's uh, like if you have. Component versus system. Yes. A system is an integration of the components. So you understand the subsurface and surface. If you have a UR, you have to understand the surface. How are you going to bring the CO2? How are you going to treat it at the exit? Things that you're looking only at the reservoir and the components. 
side, you have to look at it from an integrated. We, we did talk about a 65 to 85 percent recovery process today. What would it take to get that now contested in developing or even technology development state? Yeah, I think from what you showed, you showed your concept, you proved your concept based on the movies I've seen uh, today. So I, I would say you already completed three, possibly you're in four. You need to move with that, and if you go to this, as you move here, you need to get operation people talking to see their problems and let them come and say that I have this context, this problem, this reservoir. So to start doing the, the test on the real rock, not only on the, the sand drain. So all these kind of things are four, five, six. You see? Uh, but I think it's possible. Why not? Because you showed the concept through gravity drainage that you can yeah, really clean the rock. Is the bottom part of the concept you was? I've seen the top one, but I, I like the bottom one. But yeah, it's ours. To smile to continue. And where universities <laughs> work closely. But yes. Imagine Exxon starting an institute here, right? Um, and uh, PI Petroleum Institute is part of that. I think we have that advantage yes. that we can work across the country. What do you see as the role of, uh, like Chris, for example, works with uh, molecular engineering, and our ability to study and understand some intracranial phenomena has improved tremendously. So, do you see a role for and recovery essentially is determined by the intracranial processes in the reservoir, right? So, if we develop new materials, like maybe surfactants or maybe other material, do you see that we can? Increase, I mean, it's, uh, it looks awful to leave 65% in the crowd, knowing that it is there, yes. but you cannot get it. Is there any research activity along those lines where you look at nanomaterials? We look at it, one of the projects we have ongoing that's in the one, two, maybe three is digital rock physics. Okay. Okay, where we're looking at from nano scale to uh, millimeter scale core with some uh, lot of experiments. Uh, and this is a long-term research. So I would say there's a lot of issues when you go from the acquisition of data acquisition up to the simulation for UR. There's a lot of publication work, but right now I think there's still a, a lot of uncertainties that one needs to understand the gaps. And so I would say the research is still there, but molecular modeling, from what I've seen in other uh, disciplines, should contribute clearly in that kind of low TRL range. And once the proof of concept is done, so we can see how molecular engineering can, can help uh, maybe uh, recover in the same way that Dan was showing today, that kind of movie, then, then we can start saying, okay, we can design a product. Uh, but I would say, yes, I think all these new ideas need to confront each other. So it's good. Design it so that risk goes down as you get to seven. Okay? And, and a lot of projects will not even pass stage gate one. Don't talk about falling, falling, uh, falling in the value of debt, simply because there's still a research product. But manpower, you can have one person in one or two. When you start getting four, five, six, no, it's a team. It's hardware, it's qualification much more expensive. So yeah, I would say 10 to 100 times more expensive than a single man show here. Yeah. Uh, and so as you get closer, once you get to seven, it's 100 millions in the field. You have to mobilize wells, stop production. If there's any problem, you have to correct. And the operation guys are very worried when you come with a pilot. 
oh my gosh, if something goes wrong, the spill, the flare. Uh, so no, no, it's a risky, risky business. But the more you explain what the risks are and get the champion, we were saying, coming from the asset, who generally has had some exposure or has that kind of determination to test new technologies, then that's how you should do it. You should really find, particularly the first pilots, people who are really willing to use your technique. There are different type of technology. I don't think it's one. One is uh, the, the chemicals that you want to put. They have to be low cost. In the current environment, you have to be lower cost. Um, but you have the whole system to, to inject and recover. So the drilling technique, completion technique for uh, extraction, for production, that needs to be optimized. The other thing is monitoring the geophysics that I was saying. Geophysics doesn't mean only seismic, we put EM, electromagnetic, but we need, no matter what, we need to monitor interwell. Monitoring at the well is important, but somewhere you will need to know you're injecting a lot of lethal type of products, you need to know where they are. Even from an environmentally point of view, you cannot just say, we'll hope, we'll wait to see where it shows up. A couple of years later, you'll see it in some other place. It's a nightmare. So, I think there are several technologies that need to, to, to be uh, mature to get to the 70%. Yes. You mentioned that uh, control relevant environment in, in, uh, in terms of CO2 you are, what would be a control relevant environment? This would be, uh, it's not the field. It's the next to the field, so the control could be a well test. In, in a, say, like a service company, they will have a well that's not in a field, which is in a controlled environment, where they can test if you inject CO2. <coughs> and they have all the monitoring gauges that they can do that. So it's the last step before you go to the field. Once you're in the field, it means it's a real environment. So the controlled environment is things that contractors generally have uh, in their uh, development labs. You know, so you have their own well test facilities, so that's what we mean by the controlled environment. But do you need some sort of reservoir? Not necessarily the reservoir, but you need something that's as a control. It could be a reservoir if you had all the measurements that are required, but it's not the reservoir that you're going to use for the pilot. It's to de-risk again. This, all this approach, if you had to find a way, is you de-risk. So you progressively, here you put everything together, but you put it in a controlled environment before going to the real world. But that wouldn't be possible for the university. No, no, no. I don't think universities should handle 456. They should not lead. They should participate, as you see here. Now, a lot of startups are created for 456. Generally, startups like to be in the six. Unfortunately, some of them, when they start, they take patents from the university. They believe they're already in six. And that's why more than half of the startups generally don't lead somewhere. They just fail. Because they expected that they were closer to six. In fact, they were at three, four. And to go from four to six may take, say, five years. A startup cannot survive five years of investment, staff, people, and uh, on its own. So that's the whole point: is we need to recognize that four, five, six it should not be led by a university per se. The university has special, uh, I think, mission for education, doing research, basic science, understanding. You could have spin-off from universities. These companies around universities that do four, five, six. So yeah, I, I would say the university should help, as you see here. The role is important, but they should not lead. In ADNOC, we're saying ADNOC should lead that part, but if it's not ADNOC, some entity outside, maybe close to the university, but it should be the university itself. At least that's my, my experience. I don't know, Mark, if you... 
across the ocean in the air. And that's why I said I like this diagram. It shows the responsibility is changing as we go across the percentage of the university responsibility versus the team versus the company. It's a beautiful diagram that illustrates that concept. Can I continue on that question? One last question. Okay. 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 Well, on that front, uh, my PhD students asked a very good question. So I would like to continue. I'm saying, would Adnan be interested in participating in that four, five, and six level of activities, even outside of Abu Dhabi? Uh, 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 the field right here in Louisiana? Uh, four, five, yes, six, no, six. You start preparing the pilot, you need to start there. There. Being concerned okay. about the target. Four, why not? I think it's interesting to try that in the proof of concept. Five, it's doable, but definitely not six. So, you need to start being concerned about our type of rocks, our environments in, in five. Because you get our attention. If you want to get our interest, then you get to have our rocks, or at least perform some tests on our rocks and understand them. But here, I think, uh, yeah, for the uh, three, four, it's, it's very good. Yeah, how, how does that process work? It's the second part of the same question. How does that continue that? <laughs> <laughs> so please join me in thanking. Uh,